Welcome to the lecture entitled The Deductive Nomological Model of Scientific Explanation. I'm Andrew Chapman. In this lecture, we'll examine eight topics. One, how to investigate the nature of scientific explanation. Two, positivism, Hempel, and causation. Three, the relation between explanation and expectation. Four, the deductive nomological model of scientific explanation. Five, the deductive statistical and inductive statistical models as deductive nomological variants. Six, counterexamples to the DN model's claims of necessity and sufficiency. 7. Empiricism and natural laws, and 8. Taking stock of the DN model. In investigating the nature of scientific explanation, it's important to notice that most people take science to offer a particular sort of explanation. There's good reason to think that one of the things that separates different explanatory disciplines, that is, disciplines that give explanations from one another, is the sorts of explanations given. Thus, the sort of explanation given by an explanatory discipline can serve to demarcate that discipline from other explanatory disciplines. Even further, however, there's good reason to think, and most scientists certainly do think, that the explanations given by science within its particular domain, namely the domain of natural phenomena, are better than competing explanations given by non-scientific disciplines. Thus, science claims a sort of priority over explanations of natural phenomena since science claims its explanations are the best ones available of natural phenomena. An investigation of scientific explanation is an inquiry into the nature or essence of scientific explanation. In order to search for this nature or essence, we should start by analyzing the notion of scientific explanation. Such an analysis of the notion of scientific explanation will result in an explication of explanation. An explication is a completed analysis of a thing, and explications, as their name suggests, make explicit the nature of that thing by providing the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as that thing. Thus, when searching for the nature or essence of scientific explanation, we should attempt an explication of the notion of scientific explanation. This explication will result in the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as a scientific explanation. Logical positivism, sometimes called logical empiricism, although the latter is technically a separate position, was a philosophical school founded in Berlin and especially Vienna in the 1920s. The goal of the logical positivists was to place philosophy on the secure path of a science. Many positivists had become exasperated with the speculative metaphysical theorizing of the 19th century, especially that of Hegel and his followers. The problem, thought the positivists, was that this metaphysical theorizing, this metaphysical philosophizing, could be done from the armchair. It required no appeal to empirical data. The theories of the positivists required that all philosophical statements be grounded, ultimately, in some actual or possible experiential or sensory state. 
their adherence to a combination of empiricism and the tools of deductive logic resulted in their official theory of scientific explanation, Hempel's deductive nomological model. Karl Hempel, who was alive for most of the 20th century, was a philosopher of science aligned with logical positivism and logical empiricism. His most enduring contribution to the philosophy of science is his deductive nomological theory of scientific explanation, the picture of scientific explanation that we're looking at in this lecture. Causation has traditionally been taken to be an important component of scientific explanation. The thought is that citing an event's cause is important or even sufficient for explaining that event. Causation is a connection between two events. One, the cause, which is temporally first, and the other, the effect, which is temporally second. Of course, it's important to recognize that not all events that occur one right after another are instances of causation. For example, suppose that the school day begins in Moscow and one second later I wake up in the United States to start my day. While these are sequential events, the former didn't cause the latter, and we know this. However, what does causation look like? Can we see or smell or hear or taste or feel causation? Of course, we might be able to see, smell, hear, taste, feel events, but causation isn't the event. Causation is the glue that holds between the events. Philosopher David Hume noted that empirically, sensorily, via experience. What we call instances of causation are merely constant conjunctions of events. We never see or experience the causation. Thus, empiricism can't make sense of our knowledge of the existence of causal relationships. Hempel was well aware of this, and he didn't want to deny flat out that something like causation was relevant to explanation. So he re-described causal relationships in terms of relationships of law-like natural necessity. According to Hempel, events call out for an explanation when they are unexpected. Nobody looks at an expected event and says, explain this. Thus, to give an explanation of an event, according to Hempel, is show how the event wasn't unexpected at all. To give an explanation is just to show that once we attend to natural facts that are already understood, we would have expected the explanandum event, the thing calling out for an explanation, to have occurred. The best way, says Hempel, to show that an explanandum event is expected is to appeal to the interaction of two sorts of facts. One, facts concerning boundary conditions or initial conditions or contingent goings-on in the world. And two, facts concerning natural law. It's these facts concerning natural law that Hempel puts in to his theory of explanation to somewhat take the place of the work that causation was doing, since empiricists can't countenance causation. Imagine that a jar smashed on the floor at some time, just call it time T1, that might seem unexpected until you notice that the jar didn't fall off by itself, it fell off the end of a conveyor belt that was moving at some rate, call it R, and the jar was placed on the conveyor belt distance D from the end of the belt, and the jar was placed there at some earlier time, call it T0. We have a lot of information now. 
Given all of this information, the rate, the distance, and the time that the jar was initially placed on the conveyor belt, you could have predicted that the jar would have fallen off at the time that it did. Thus, the rate, the distance, and the initial time that the jar was placed on the conveyor belt all together would have explained what happened by allowing you to have predicted that the jar would have fallen on the ground. In this analogy, the distance and the initial time are analogous to boundary conditions, things that could have been different, and the rate that the conveyor belt is moving at is analogous to a natural law. Think about this picture of the expectedness of explanation like a machine that has a predictable input-output relationship. You know that if you put these sorts of inputs into it, then you'll get these sorts of outputs. So once you know what the inputs are, and you have your knowledge of the machine, you know what the output will be. So if we look at Hempel's schematic interpretation of the DN model, we have a number of boundary conditions, call them C1, C2, C3, etc., all the way up to CK, and some laws, call them L1, L2, L3, etc., and if you know all the C's, and if you know all the L's, then E, the explanandum event, just falls out of that knowledge, or is to be expected from that knowledge. Says Hempel, the kind of explanation thus characterized I will call deductive nomological explanation, for it amounts to a deductive subsumption of the explanandum under principles which have the character of general laws. It answers the question, why did the explanandum event occur by showing that the event resulted from the particular circumstances specified in C1, C2, etc., in accordance with the laws L1, L2, etc.? This conception of explanation, as exhibited in the schema above, has therefore been referred to as the covering law model or as the deductive model of explanation. And this model of explanation does have a number of different names. The ones you'll hear most often are deductive nomological model, covering law model, or just the classical model or classical view of scientific explanation. According to Hempel, any scientific explanation must meet all of the criteria of the DN model, or else it isn't a real scientific explanation. That's to claim that all of the criteria are necessary for something to be a scientific explanation, and anything that meets all of the criteria of the DN model is a scientific explanation. That's to claim that all of the criteria together are sufficient for something to be a scientific explanation. There are four criteria that are individually necessary and jointly sufficient for something to be a scientific explanation. Criterion 1. The explanation must be in or be able to be put into the form of a valid deductive argument in which the conclusion of the argument is the explanandum, and the set of the premises of the argument is the explanans. Criterion 2. The explanans must contain, that is, one of the premises of the argument must be, a natural law that is actually needed in the logical deduction. Criterion 3. Each of the members of the explanans, that is, each of the premises of the argument, must be empirically testable. And criterion four, 
each of the members of the explanans, that is, each of the premises of the argument, must be true. Each one of these criteria needs a little bit of unpacking, explanation, and defense. So let's look at each one of them in turn. The first criterion discusses the form of any possible explanation. This criterion says that for something to count as a scientific explanation, the explanation must be in or be able to be put into the form of a valid deductive argument in which the conclusion of the argument is the explanandum, the thing being explained, and the set of the premises of the argument is the explanins, the thing doing the explaining. This is where the DN model gets its D from, since all explanations need to be in the form of a deductive argument. A deductive argument is a set of two or more sentences, one of which, known as the conclusion, should follow logically from the other or others, known as the premises. A deductive argument is a valid deductive argument when it would be impossible for all of the premises to be true while the conclusion is false. Notice that this doesn't say that the premises or the conclusion actually are true. What it's saying is that if the premises of a valid deductive argument were true, then the conclusion would have to be true. Remember, this is the form that any scientific explanation needs to take. Here's a very simple example of a valid deductive argument. This thing itself isn't an explanation, it's just what a valid deductive argument looks like. Premise one, Andrew is a human. Premise two, all humans are mortal. Therefore, conclusion, Andrew is mortal. Notice that this is valid because if one and two were true, then three would have to be true. There's no possible way to make 1 and 2 true and have 3 false. Remember what Hempel is trying to do here. He's trying to show that the explanandum, which is the conclusion of this valid deductive argument form, is expected given the explanin sentences or what end up being the premises in this deductive argument form. If you can logically derive that something will have happened from laws and boundary conditions, that's about as strong as you can get in terms of expecting it to happen. The second necessary criterion for something to count as a scientific explanation according to the DM model, is that the explanins must contain, that is, one of the premises of the argument must be, a natural law that is actually needed in the logical deduction. Nomological means law-like, so this criterion is where the DN model gets its N from. We've already seen why Hempel thinks that laws are required for something to be a scientific explanation. Laws are what move us from contingent and particular boundary conditions to our explanandum event with regularity and necessity. This regularity and necessity is what allows for us to expect the explanandum event and hence what allows for explanation. It's important to note that not just any natural law will do to satisfy this particular criterion. The natural law cited as part of the explanins must be necessary for the deduction, such that if that natural law were removed from the explanins, we couldn't get from the premises to the conclusion of our valid deductive argument. This stipulation prevents someone from throwing an irrelevant natural law into the explanins and then claiming that they've got a scientific explanation. This makes sure that the law is relevant 
to the explanandum. The third necessary criterion for something to count as a scientific explanation according to the DN model is that each of the members of the explanans, that is, each of the premises of our deductive argument, must be empirically testable. Something can't be an explanation unless the thing doing the explaining is grounded in sensory experience, says Hempel. This criterion is a conclusion of Hempel's positivism, but even a non-positivist would probably find this stipulation plausible. According to many people, scientific explanations are supposed to objectively tie humans to the world, such that the understanding that results from scientific explanation is understanding of the world as it actually is, objectively. The standard way of attempting to secure this objectivity has been via empirical evidence. Even further, the scientific community is well known for priding itself on both how empirical science is as well as how testable science is. This criterion heeds both empiricality and testability. Of course, testability does not mean provability. It simply means able to be tested. So don't make the mistake of thinking that since something might not be able to be proven completely, that that means that it runs afoul of this criterion. All we have to be able to do is run some tests that are relevant to the truth or falsity of each of the sentences in the explanins in order for this criterion to be met. And finally, the fourth necessary criterion for something to count as a scientific explanation, according to the DN model, is that each of the members of the explanants, that is, each of the premises of our argument, must be true. The reason behind this criterion is intuitive. Something can't be explained by citing falsehoods. If you ask me where the presence under the tree came from, that is, if you ask me to explain the existence of the presence under the tree, and I cite Santa Claus and his near-infinite benevolence, I've failed to explain the existence of the presence under the tree. The fact that you might falsely think that Santa Claus exists, and thus that you might take my Santa explanation to be a real explanation, does not make it an explanation. Since scientific explanations are supposed to objectively tie humans to the world, according to Hempel, it's not impossible that we could be wrong occasionally about whether something is a good explanation or not. In fact, much of the scientific enterprise is trying to figure out whether explanations that have been given are actually good explanations. And the fact that the explanant sentences must be true doesn't mean that we have to be able to prove that the sentences are true. There's a difference between whether something is true and whether we know that it's true. So, we might have a good explanation on our hands and not yet know it. Now, while some scientific explanations cite natural laws that describe what is always the case, other scientific explanations cite statistical facts about what is true in some percentage of cases that is less than 100%. Think here of explanations of how a person contracted an illness. Some percentage of people less than 100% that comes in contact with a particular pathogen contacts the illness, the explanation might be. Further, while some scientific explanations can be put into the form of a valid deductive argument whose conclusion must be true if its premises are true, other scientific explanations can only be put into the form of a strong inductive argument, which is a sort of argument whose conclusion is rendered probable given true premises. Think here of explanations of how a person got lung cancer by smoking. 
While it's true that their smoking explains their cancer, not all people who smoke get lung cancer. Knowing that someone smoked doesn't guarantee that that person has lung cancer. It only increases the probability that they have or will get lung cancer. To accommodate these truths about statistical facts sometimes replacing natural laws and about induction sometimes replacing deduction, two variants of the DN model were created. These are known as the deductive statistical or DS model and the inductive statistical or IS model. These models are relevantly similar in form to the DN model, so it's acceptable for us to treat the DS and IS models as variants on the DN model, rather than treating them as separate and competing models that somehow show that there's something wrong with the DN model. So DS, IS, and DN models are all just variations of the same thing, and stand or fall together. The DN model does seem to capture something important about the nature of scientific explanation. But, we might ask ourselves, is it a correct model? To ask whether the DN model is correct is to ask whether its criteria accurately capture all and only scientific explanations. In order to perform the task of seeing whether the DN model's criteria accurately capture all and only scientific explanations, we need to go out and look for counterexamples to the DN model. Even if the DN model mostly gets things right but sometimes doesn't, we need to reject the DN model as incorrect. Now, throwing out a model even if it's mostly correct isn't being pedantic or a stickler. One of the things that philosophers are often charged with is being too exacting with their standards, but remember what philosophers of science are generally trying to do. They're generally trying to find the essence or nature of things within science, and we can't do that if we're not strict about our investigative standards. In examining the nature of scientific explanation, we're trying to see what exactly scientists are and ought to be up to when they offer scientific explanations. Even if what scientists are up to is 95% correctly described by the DN model, and the other 5% is something that scientists just know when they see it, then we should worry that there aren't actual standards for explanation. And that would be a big problem. A counterexample is something that proves that a proposed definition or analysis is incorrect. It's an example that runs counter to the proposal. Counterexamples come in two forms, ones that show that a proposal is too narrow and thus question its necessity, and ones that show that a proposal is too broad and thus question its sufficiency. Consider this. When we offer a definition or analysis, we want it to apply to all of the things that are being defined or analyzed, and not to apply to anything else other than what's being defined or analyzed. If, in the diagram I'll show you in a moment, the green circle is all the things being defined or analyzed, the red circle is other things, and the blue circle is our proposed definition, then we have four possibilities. The blue circle here is our analysis or definition. The green circle in this first possibility fits completely within the blue circle, so the blue circle captures everything that's under analysis. 
The red circle is the other things that we don't want our analysis to capture, and in this first example it's completely outside of the analysis. So in this first example we've got an accurate definition or analysis. This first example is what a correct explication of something looks like. All of the stuff that should be within the analysis is, and nothing that shouldn't be within the analysis is. A second possibility is that our analysis captures everything that it should, but it also manages to capture some of the stuff that it shouldn't. This would be an analysis that is too broad, and thus this would be showing that the analysis is not fully sufficient. All of the criteria are not sufficient for something to count as what it should. A third possibility is that our analysis rules out everything that it's supposed to, but it doesn't rule in everything it's supposed to. Some of the things that should be ruled in by the analysis aren't. This is an analysis that is too narrow, and thus this is an analysis all of whose criteria are not necessary for something to be the thing under analysis. Now, the relationship between too narrow and problem for necessity and too broad and problem for sufficiency can be somewhat difficult to remember, so start by just memorizing those connections and then if you can remember these spatial diagrams about too broad and too narrow and how they're related to sufficiency problems and necessity problems respectively, then you'll have it. And then a fourth possibility is that our analysis doesn't capture everything that it should, and it also allows in things that it shouldn't. This is the worst of both worlds. This is an analysis that is both too broad and too narrow. This is an analysis whose criteria are not sufficient when they say they are and are not necessary when they say they are. So can we find counterexamples in the form of challenges to necessity or challenges to sufficiency for the DN model? Yes, in fact, we can. A counterexample that challenges the necessity of the DN model's four criteria is one that claims that the criteria are too narrow, that they don't capture all of the things that are scientific explanations. Even if there are many things that are scientific explanations that do cite laws, there seem to be many scientific explanations that don't cite laws at all. Consider, for example, explanations from history concerning why a particular war occurred, or explanations from sociology concerning why a particular social group fractured, or explanations from psychology concerning why a person developed the phobia that they did. All of these seem like perfectly acceptable scientific explanations, but none of them cite laws, or in the case of the DS or IS models, none of them cite statistical facts as parts of the explanation. If there can be scientific explanations that don't meet all of the DN model's criteria, then that means that not all of those criteria are necessary for something to be a scientific explanation, and thus the definition given by the DN model is too narrow. A counterexample that challenges the sufficiency of the DN model's four criteria is one that claims that the criteria are too broad, that they capture things that aren't scientific explanations. Consider the flagpole shadow counterexample attributed to Sylvan Bromberger. 
If we know the length of a flagpole's shadow, the angle of incidence of the sunlight to the flagpole, and some facts about how light travels and how trigonometry works, then we can determine the height of the flagpole. Of course, everybody knows this. But what this means is that we can create a valid deductive argument whose conclusion is a statement of the height of the flagpole whose premises contain laws, how light travels, things about trigonometry, and whose premises are empirically testable and true. Thus, we've got something that meets all four of the DN model's criteria for something to count as a scientific explanation. So according to the DN model, we are able to explain why the flagpole is the height it is by referencing the length of its shadow. But that's not right. This is getting things exactly backwards. The length of the shadow is explained by the height of the flagpole and not the other way around. Now, of course, this isn't denying that you can determine or derive the height of the flagpole from all those other things. What it's doing is saying derivation alone isn't explanation, but of course, that's what the DN model is saying, that if you're able to derive something from other facts concerning laws and empirically testable things that are true, then you have yourself an explanation. If there can be things that meet all of the DN model's criteria, but that aren't scientific explanations, then those criteria are not sufficient for something to count as a scientific explanation, and thus the criteria are too broad. So we've now seen challenges to the necessity and the sufficiency of the four criteria. Even further here, there's a worry for any empiricist, and Hempel is certainly an empiricist, who makes use of the concept of a natural law. Imagine that you observe some event happen over and over again in exactly the same way. Every time you observe an event of that kind, it looks exactly the same. How can you tell whether the event is an instance of a natural law or, instead, an instance of a mere accidental regularity. That is, what is the observable difference for the empiricist between a natural law and an accidental regularity? In what ways is a natural law empirically different from an accidental regularity? Well, of course, there is no observable empirical difference between the two. The difference between a natural law and an accidental regularity comes in terms of the necessity of the law and the contingency of the accidental regularity. But we can't observe whether something could have been different, which is what necessity tells us about. All we can ever observe is how things actually are. Thus, empiricism can't make sense of our knowledge of the difference between natural laws and accidental regularities, and thus, empiricists can't claim to have knowledge of when something is a natural law rather than a mere accidental regularity. Now, this is just a problem for an empiricist who wants to use the DN model. If someone's a rationalist and claims that there is knowledge that's possible from non-sensory sources, they could use the DN model and not have this problem, but of course they would end up having the necessity and sufficiency problems that we've already looked at. Even if the DN model and the DS and IS models, uh, even if they do go some way to telling some part of the story of the nature of scientific explanation, it can't possibly be the whole story that they tell. We've seen instances in which the DN model is too broad, and we've seen instances in which it's too narrow. Instances in which it's too broad are ones where it says that things that aren't explanations are, and instances where it's too narrow are instances where it says that things that are clearly explanations are not. 
And there are many other counterexamples out there that we didn't look at here that show the same thing in terms of problems with necessity and sufficiency. Therefore, what we can conclude is that the DN model is not an accurate model of scientific explanation. But we should be careful here that we don't just scrap every single thing the DN model claimed. The DN model was plausible to Hempel and many others because there was something intuitively correct about what at least parts of the DN model claimed about explanation. Our task as philosophers of science is to determine what it was that the DN model was getting correct and what it was getting incorrect, and to jettison the former while building on the latter. The DN model is what's known as a syntactic model of scientific explanation. It is concerned only with the structure of a scientific explanation. Syntax is generally applied to sentences to talk about the order of the words, the structure of the sentence. But more broadly, what syntax means is things concerned with structure. So a syntactic model of scientific explanation is a model that's concerned with the structure of the explanation. The DN model says that there's nothing more to scientific explanation than producing something that has the right components in the right places. Thus, even a simple computer that was properly programmed could create DN-style explanations, and this was supposed to be a feature of the DN model, not a bug. One of the goals of the DN model was to make things as objective as possible to keep out potentially biasing human influences of any sort. However, scientific explanations, even though they're directed at the objective world, are human-centered things. Humans request, develop, and employ scientific explanations and, as such, a model of scientific explanation that entirely ignores the essentially human component of explanations seems to be missing something that's necessary for explanation. While the structure of an explanation is certainly important, the context of the explanation matters too. And this context that's embedded in human affairs is ignored by the DN model. Now this doesn't tell us how to fix the DN model, but it points us in the right direction for where we might go to figure out what exactly was wrong and what exactly was right about the DN model. In this lecture, we've covered eight topics. One, how to investigate the nature of scientific explanation. Two, Positivism, Hempel, and Causation. 3. The Relation Between Explanation and Expectation. 4. The Deductive Nomological Model of Scientific Explanation. 5. The Deductive Statistical and Inductive Statistical Models as Deductive Nomological Variants. 6 counterexamples to the DN model's claims of necessity and sufficiency, 7. Empiricism and natural laws, and 8. Taking stock of the DN model. Thank you.